Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I am Wilmer Leon. Here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode of this podcast, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between the current events and the broader historic context in which they occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, we explore the presidential candidacy of Dr. Cornell West. If you go to Cornell West. 2024.com, it opens with this. Brother Cornell West is a living embodiment of the power of an independent mind, forever reminding us that greatness is born of the courage to stand apart and speak one's truth. To help me connect these dots, let's turn to my guest. He needs no introduction, but I'll say he is the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Professor of Philosophy and Christian Practice at Union Theological Seminary. He's the former university professor at Harvard University and professor emeritus at Princeton University. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard in three years and obtained his master's and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He's the first black person to to receive a PhD in philosophy from Princeton University. He's written 20 books, edited 13, and has written numerous forewords, as uh, as we'll talk about in, in, in more detail. Let me say, he's one of Sacramento's own and affectionately known to many as Brother West. With you, though, man. And we putting smiles on our precious mama's faces. I know mom was there (laughs) right there in the living room and in the kitchen when you got home and your precious mother had passed. But you just think how blessed we are. I think it's very uh, providential as well as significant that uh, we could start this year together. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned mentioned our parents because uh, what would your folks be thinking of their son and these efforts today? Well, you know, it's hard to say. Mom and dad were unpredictable in terms of their judgment <laughs> and highly predictable in terms of their deep, deep love, though, brother, so that they, they would be loving me to death as they always did up until their death, and they love me now after death. Uh, on after their life, but I think it's hard to say. You know, they were such independent thinkers. You know what I mean? I do. Uh, I do know. That. Let, 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 me, let me put let me, let me put you let me put you another way. Then, uh, what what would what are the two or three most salient points or lessons that you carry forward that your parents instilled in you? Oh, one is that uh, you want to be in the world, but not of it, so that you always recognize that standards bigger than you, you will always fall short of those standards, but never forget what they are. And those standards are always faith, hope, and the greatest of them is love, love of God, love of neighbor, uh, uh, love of especially the least of these, love especially of poor and working people, love especially of those friends for known called the wretched of the earth. That's what I learned in West household. You can see it, my brother Cliff, my sister Cynthia and Cheryl, and you certainly can see it in Shiloh Baptist Church right on Ninth Avenue at Old Park, brother, with Reverend Willie P. Cook and others. So those were the crucial things, you know, that not just the values in the abstract sense, but the virtues in the lived concrete sense of ways of being in the world, modes of existing, trying to be forces for good in the language of the great John Coltrane. You see his various uh, uh, incarnation in terms of his faces on the albums here in the backdrop of my room. I uh, thank my dear wife, Anahita, for that and buying me this gift. It's a beautiful gift. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think for them, the question becomes, are you being true to that calling? Mm-hmm. Are you being true to that vocation? Are you being true to that which t- tries to lure out of you the best who you are, given the crack vessel that you are? And I, um, I, I take those, uh, those, those insights and those lessons very, very seriously, though, brother. So I wake up every morning and I say, hey, crack vessel that I am, 
center that I've always been. I'm going to be a force for good. I'm going to tell some truth. I'm going to bear some witness. I'm going to seek justice. And I'm going to do it no matter what cost, no matter what burden, no matter what responsibility it entails, because that's what I'm here to do. And I'm going to do it with fun, joy. I just finished the autobiography of Brother Sly Stone. Thank you oh, for wow. letting me be myself. Uh huh. And he talks about, you know, Cynthia Robinson, you know, from Sacramento. Yes. Her beloved uh, sister, Anita Robinson, we went to high school together. We talked about Cynthia Robinson when he moved to Sacramento for a while, Sacramento Inspirational Choir. You know, he had played cello sometimes with uh, Clarence Adams and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Bobby Adams and Brother Clarence. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I used to see Sylvester on, on the organ right there, Shiloh, man. Mm-hmm. I did not. He's wow. from Vallejo, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, I know he's from Vallejo, but I didn't yeah. know that he had spent uh, spent time in Sacramento. Oh, uh, Lord, yeah. It, 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 it says on your site, even as a young child, you exhibited the remarkable qualities that would define your life's journey and the path to the presidency. In the third grade, you fearlessly stood up to your teacher challenging her ideas and defining defying the conventional norms of your time. And, and that stands out to me because uh, during the medal ceremony of the Olympics in uh, 1968 in Mexico City, as you recall, John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their black glove fists uh, during the playing of the national anthem. And on October 17th, the day after that, I went to school raised my fist during the morning pledge of the allegiance and I got kicked out of school. Mm-hmm. And I read that on your site and, and thought about the kind of the parallels uh, of, of our lives. And, and here we sit today still challenging the dominant narrative and the ideas and defying the conventional norms of our time. And, and I think that I think is a very that, good summary beautiful. of your of your candidacy. That's beautiful. But I think that's also an example, though, brother, of how your precious mother and my precious mother and precious fathers mm-hmm. as well tried to, to support into us uh, examples of integrity, honesty, and decency. And uh, when you have a flag that's waving, that's not signifying what it ought in terms of us talk about liberty and justice for all, but you got lynching going on and you got degradation, discrimination, segregation going on. It's just decent. It's to have integrity, to have honesty is to call it into question. And when you do that, you're going to be in the world, but not of it because you're going to be going against the grain. You're going to be going against what is popular in the name of what ought to have a certain kind of moral substance and spiritual content to it. And here, that was how many years ago now, man? That was, uh, ooh, 1968 is... Uh, oh, that was 50, 56 uh, 50, years. years. Yeah. That's 56 50, years. Right. You see, I refused to salute the flag because my great uncle had been lynched in Texas and they wrapped the flag around his body. So that's what I associated as a young brother. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I don't put other people down for saluting the flag because when some people see that flag and they... Think of their, 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 their husband or their uncle or their, their their wife who was killed in the war. And they loved they They got right to support their loved ones. And they were fighting for that flag. But that's what goes in their mind. But my mind is the flag wrapped around a body swaying in the southern breeze. It's strange fruit that Billie Holiday sang about. So everybody has their right to respond. Same was true with Brother Colin. When mm-hmm. Colin saw that flag, he thought of all of these young black brothers and sisters being killed by the police. Yeah, he gets down. He can understand that. Somebody else see the flag and they think of their uncle in Hiroshima, a great uncle in Hiroshima who's fighting against Japanese fascism. Sure, everybody's got their lens through which they view the world. We have to be open to that. But most importantly, we got to be true to ourselves. In, in talking about your candidacy, you announced your candidacy in the People's Party switch to the Green Party, and now you're running as what you call a truly, truly a people's campaign that is a movement rooted in truth, justice, and love. Uh, why the changes, and where are we with your candidacy today? Yes, yeah, it, 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 back in June, June 5th, it was the People's Party that came forward. It met with 
myself and brother Chris Hedges, my dear brother, I have great mm -hmm. respect for, great love for. And uh, uh, they were kind enough to make the invitation. When I accepted the invitation, I realized very quickly that uh, there were going to be some very deep challenges. There's going to be some very deep problems there. Chris Hedges and Jill Stein and Ajum, Jamu Barak and others asked me to meet with the Green Party people and to see whether there was a possibility we met. We made the shift to the Green Party. We worked very closely for a good while. And I realized that the Green Party had so many different requirements in terms of uh, internal debates with presidential candidates going to different states and state conventions and so forth. And I wanted to go directly to the people because I've been going directly to the folk. Mm -hmm. And I realized that even though the Green Party had 17 states in regard to ballot access, that I could actually get 15 or 16 states rather quickly. And that's precisely what we're doing now. You know, we already got Alaska. We're moving on to Utah by eyes of March. March 15th, we should have, we hope, a good 15 states or so, so I would have caught up with the Green Party. But I have a freedom to really not just be myself more fully, but also to go directly to the people rather than spending so much time on intra-party activities like that the Green Party uh, uh, requires. And so, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, you got false starts. I say, no, no, I'm a jazz man. That's first take. That's first <laughs> take. <laughs> Folks can go to your website, uh, CornellWest2024.com, click on the platform tab, and they can see a list of general areas such as economic justice, worker justice, environmental justice, and then and a, and a number of others. And, and then below each of those, there are the bullet points that articulate your positions on those issues. And uh, I'd like to get to this point, this particular point, because... I think it allows us to speak to a number of things that are impacting not only this country, but the world. And that is the United States supporting, funding, and arming genocide in Gaza. How does an American administration, the Biden administration, with the backing of Congress and particularly the Congressional Black Caucus, which is supposed to be the con the conscious of the Congress. How can they how can they back this play? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question, oh brother. I think we have to first begin by situating uh, my campaign as a moment in a movement that's rooted in a great tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. and Fannie Lou Hamer, Rabbi Heschel, and Dorothy Day, uh, uh, and what they were about was first. There's a moral starting point. Mm -hmm. See that a precious Palestinian baby has exactly the same value as your baby or my baby, an Israeli baby, a Haitian baby, an Egyptian baby, a Guatemalan baby. So there's been almost 9,000 babies killed in 50 some, some days. We can see just the level of barbarity there. Now every life, no matter what color, mm -hmm. uh, uh, agenda for me has the same value. There's no doubt about that. But you, you start with on a moral premise. Then you got to move to your social analysis. How could it be that the United States, the American empire enables not just this genocidal assault that's been going on, but how has it enabled the apartheid regime for so long of Israel vis-a-vis -vis those occupied territories where precious Palestinians have been subjugated and degraded? How has it facilitated ethnic cleansing, where you're seeing now almost 2 million fellow Palestinians who are pushed out of their land. Well, the same thing happened in 1948 when 750,000 Palestinians, were, they called Arabs at the time, were pushed out. So you start on a moral note. Now, I begin on a spiritual note just as a Christian, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that, that there's certain principles that I'm not going to give up and there's oppressed peoples, no matter where they are, no matter, they can be in Kashmir, they can be in Chad, they can be in South Side Chicago, they can be white brothers and sisters in Kentucky, they can be Latinos in, 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 in South LA. Their lives have exactly the same value as the, as the lives of the rich and wealthy and famous. And when you proceed in that way, you have a set of lens that you're looking at the world that's very different from 
any of the parties, because you see both parties, Republicans and Democratic parties, have been so tied to Israel in a critical way. Israel's been proceeding with impunity for decades, not just since October 7th, for decades. They've been able to do and say anything they want. They've been able to get billions and billions of dollars from taxpayers' money to the United States with no accountability whatsoever. And when people try to impose some accountability, be it the United Nations or be it progressive Jews or be it Palestinians or Arabs or other people around the world, Israel acts as if they can still do what they want to do with no answerability and no responsibility. They just proceed and do what they want to do. And you say, well, wait a minute. And we've reached the point now where, oh, my brother, you got the invoking of Amalek, you know, the First Samuel 15 and the third verse. What does that say in the Old Testament for Christians and Hebrew scripture for Jewish brothers and sisters? He would to kill every man, every woman, every child, every ox, every sheep. Well, that's genocidal intent. Mm -hmm. And then you got genocidal execution when you got over 22,000, and that's just a modest count because you got so many in, in the rubble uh, that are not counted. And, and, and the 9,000 children is just off the chart. I mean, it's just unimaginable that that, that could happen to so many precious children. Uh, and you say, no, what is going on? Well, then you come back to the United States and you say, wait, wait a minute now. We've got a politics where the lobby that is primarily responsible for the money that goes from the U.S. government to Israel is one of the most powerful not lobbies, not just in America, but in the history of the country, in the history of the country, and that owing to the high civic participation rate mm -hmm. of Jewish Americans. When we talk about Jewish Americans, you're never talking about a monolith or a homogeneous group. You're talking about a variety of different kinds of Jews. Because we've seen the Jewish the young people and the Jewish progressives are as critical of Israel as I am. Jewish Why? Voices for Peace. That Jewish Voices for Peace, if not now, uh -huh. we've got a, a whole host of them uh, uh, that have been quite courageous in that regard. So it's not a matter and must never be a matter of anti-Jewish hatred, anti-Jewish sentiment. It's hating, occupation, domination, subjugation. In this case, it's Israeli subjugation, Israeli domination, Israeli occupation. Now, the sad thing is... is but wait a minute. It's also understanding the difference between Zionism and Judaism. That's and right. as much as the dominant narrative wants to try to equate those two, they are not the same. One is a religious practice, and the other, for the most part, is a political ideology. That's exactly right. I mean, it makes what makes it difficult, really, is that um, you see, Jewish brothers and sisters have been terrorized and traumatized and hated for over twenty five hundred years mm -hmm. uh, with different attacks, assaults, pogroms, culminating in the show and the Holocaust with the gangster Hitler and the gangster Nazis and so forth, and they jump out of the burning buildings of Europe and they're looking for a place to go. Zionism is a 19th century movement of nationalism that's looking for a, a, a home for Jews, a, a nation state for Jews. And they land on somebody else's land. It's like the pilgrims landing in the new world and saying, there's no people here. Yes, there are. Now, of course, in America, what did they say? There's no human beings, there's just buffaloes and Indians. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Indians are as human as you Europeans, we Africans, anybody else. Well, that's part of the deep white supremacy and racism that's happened. What else would happen with Zionism? That they told a lie and they said, we got, we got, we got a land with no people. That's not true. You got 750, you got almost a million. And they're 80% of the population. Don't mm -hmm. act like they don't exist. Oh, in your mind, they might be non-entities, but in God's eyes, in our eyes, they're human just like you and just like me. And so you end up with this ideology that responds to this indescribably vicious treatment of Jews for 2,500 years in the middle of Europe, so-called civilized Europe. Now, of course, Belgium already killed 7,000 Africans in mm -hmm. Belgium, Congo. In the Congo, right. Not too many Europeans said I'm mumbling words. Already 
the, the, Turkey had already killed Armenians with genocidal attacks. Europeans didn't say a mumbling word. Italy had already invaded Ethiopia. Europe, Europe didn't say a mumbling word. So you can already see the hypocrisy there. Mm -hmm. But what it makes it difficult in the United States is that our Jewish brothers and sisters who are thoroughgoing Zionists, they use the fact that Jews have been hated for so long as a fundamental foundation of what they do and that they think allows them to rationalize hating Palestinians, terrorizing Palestinians, traumatizing Palestinians. I'm against traumatizing, hating, terrorizing anybody. Mm -hmm. Anybody. If black folk were terrorizing white folk, I'm going to defend white folk. If Palestinians are terrorizing Jews, I'm going to defend Jews. If Jews are terrorizing Palestinians, I'm going to defend Palestinians. That's morality and spirituality. Now, we live in a moment and of consistency. And consistency. And a certain kind of moral consistency that you try to hold on. Now, you know and I know, man, we live in a moment of such overwhelming barbarity, man. Organized greed, institutionalized hatred, routinized indifference toward the suffering of others, especially the weak. So it's just a matter of the strong just thinking and the rich thinking they can act and do anything they like to crush the weak, you see. And, and what happens now in, in the Middle East, especially in this situation with Gaza, is that you have Netanyahu and others who are using the most reactionary tradition in the history of Zionism, which comes out of Jabotinsky, that says that there will be Jewish security only when there's either Jewish domination of Palestinians or Jewish annihilation of Palestinians. That's in the writings of Jabotinsky. Netanyahu's father was an assistant to Jabotinsky. Mm -hmm. so that is a deeply, deeply right wing of not outright fascist version of Zionism. Now, there's liberal versions of Zionism that's very different, but even those liberal versions still want to argue that Palestinians would never have equality in their state. They so what have equal status in their state. And so we have to be able to put that in historical context mm -hmm. with the right kind of morality and spirituality for people to understand why people like myself will never, ever, ever be silent when it comes to Israeli genocidal attacks on Palestinians, when it comes to is Israeli ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, and when it comes to Israeli apartheid regime. That's why South Africa's taking them to the international court. What does, how does a president, Cornell West, intervene, interject, and change the trajectory of this ongoing genocide? It means that the policy is qualitatively different than you get into Biden. It's clear that Biden has no concern for the most part with Palestinian suffering. No, well, he's, Little, he has said numerous times that he is a Zionist. He's a and, Zionist. He, he doesn't talk about the, the numbers. He doesn't talk about the suffering. He doesn't talk about the unbelievable uh, pain of Palestinians, not just now, but during the 40-some years he's been in office. You see, So from the very beginning, he makes it very, very clear that these Palestinian brothers and sisters don't count for me. They, their lives don't really matter. Now, of course, we got, we got memories of uh, white supremacists in the United States. These black people don't count. These indigenous peoples don't count. They're just fodder for our projects. We step on them like cockroaches. We crush them like they're, like they're creatures uh, below. And you say, no, no, that's not my tradition. So as president, especially shoot under a West administration, shoot, I'd be calling for the end of occupation, the end of the siege, a ceasefire to sit down and come up with a way in which Jews and Palestinians can live together under conditions of equality, with equality under the law and equality in terms of access to resources. So it's a qualitatively different way of looking at the world and proceeding in that part of the world. What about the, the most recent action of circumventing Congress and sending more arms, uh, weaponry, and military resources 
uh, to the genocide? Uh, what you know? Uh, what about how does a how does a president Cornell West cut off the spigot of the funding? Oh, one is it's uh, it's not just for me. Just a matter of withdrawing aid and cutting off the spigot, but it's a matter of trying to get the leadership, Israeli leadership, Palestinian leadership to sit down and come up with ways in which they can create a society in which they live together. And this, whatever financial support I provide is a financial support that would sustain that kind of egalitarian arrangement. There would not be a penny from a West administration for any apartheid regime, for any ethnic cleansing, and certainly not for any genocidal attack and assault on Palestinians or anybody else. So, so how do you negotiate with a Netanyahu who you just so accurately stated his father was an advisor to Jabalinsky, uh, who, who has compromised his own principles to go further right to formulate his uh, his government, and so with the Smotriches and and the and right. all of those other genocidal maniacs. That's right. How how do, how how can you negotiate with someone who is sworn to the annihilation of an entire group of human beings? Well, be one in any diplomatic process, you know, you end up sitting down with people you disagree with. But you're absolutely right. It would not so much be a negotiation with the Nathan Yahoos. It would be a teasing out of Israeli leadership that was open to egalitarian arrangement with Palestinians and a teasing out of Palestinian leadership that's open to an egalitarian arrangement uh, 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 among, among Jews. So do you really talking about trying to uh, lure and to appeal to voices and figures and movements, the combatants for uh, veterans, for example, in the, in, 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 in the, uh, uh, that has Palestinians and Israelis working together, the, uh, the Basim Taminis, who are part of the Martin Luther King Jr. tradition of struggling together, Palestinians and Jews together, and even tried to tease out some of the best of their labor movements, the trade union movements, Palestinian trade union movements, Israeli tra trade union movements, where you do have some, not enough, but you've got some, some overlap of people recognizing that Jews and Israelis can work together for something bigger than them. So you're right, it's not so much a matter of just negotiation, but it's a matter of withdrawal of funds it's a matter of a certain kind of rejection i mean you know we've got to have some wholesale rejection of fascists and that's true not just uh, uh in, in in the uh, as it relates to uh, israel and nathan yahoo but that would be true for fascism in all of its various forms it could be in iran it could be in chad it could be in in haiti it could be anywhere fascism raises its ugly face in a moving this out to a slightly broader context, uh, you have the United States through uh, the the U.S. U.N. Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield uh, vetoing the calls for a peace agreement in in Gaza. Then you have uh, the United you have the Ansar Allah or the Houthis reaching a peace agreement or working coming very very close to a peace agreement with the Saudis and the United States intervening and saying, we will not accept that. We will not accept a peace agreement that uh, we're going to label the Houthis as a terrorist organization. Therefore, Saudis will not be able to engage with the Houthis without incurring sanctions. Then you've got the conflict in uh, between Venezuela and Guyana and they reach, they, they agree I think it's St. Croix, they come to an agreement and say, we're going to work on this peaceably. And then the United States gets Britain to send a warship off the coast of God. Point being, these are three within the last 10 days. These are three examples of entities in conflict agreeing to work for peace. And the United States 
injecting militarism into the into the negotiation. How does a president Cornell West put a stop to that? I mean, one is my brother, we need exactly what you just did, which means we have to respect the people enough to tell them the truth. So so a president also has to play a role of a teacher. See, large numbers of our fellow citizens, they don't really know the truth about the Middle East. They don't really know about the truth in Latin America. They don't really know about the truth of the ways in which the American empire has been reshaping the whole world in its interest and image, both in Latin America for so long when Latin America was viewed as a kind of a, a playground for America and all the various coups and democratic elections overthrown by Chile, Argentina, Chile, Argentina, Dominican Republic, Panama, Grenada. We can go on and on and on when you look at the uh, how the U.S. government has overthrown democratically elected governments when it was not in the interest of the corporate elite uh, to accept those democratic elected uh, d- democratic uh, elections. But you have to just tell people the truth. Now, that in and of itself is a major move. Now, bro, I'm That's a major move to tell people the truth. And then beyond that, to intervene and to act. And you say, oh, now, now, as president, based on the legacy of Martin King and Fannie Lou Hamer and others, and looking at the world through the lens of the least of these poor and working people, I'm going to be putting forward policies that strike you as so outside of the realm that you are used to because these two parties, Democrats and Republicans, have been tied to big militarism abroad, Mm -hmm. military adventurism abroad, have been tied to overthrowing democratic regimes abroad, have been tied to 57 cents for every dollar going to them. And oftentimes they get more than they request, but then there's austerity when it comes to education, when it comes to housing, when it comes to jobs with a living wage, when it comes to uh, the health care and, and so forth. That's a very different way of looking at the world. I mean, the very idea of there being a U.S. president who would be an anti-imperialist. Mm-hmm. You see, I am a gut bucket anti-imperialist. And what I mean by that is that I want nations to be nations among nations. We do not need empires that try to get other nations to defer to their imperial dominance, to their imperial domination. The United States has 800 military units around the world over special operations in 100 countries. China and Russia have hardly 35 or 40 combined. Mm -hmm. Why do we need 800 military units around the world? Why do we need a ship in every shore? Well, we got corporate interests, you got US geopolitical interests, and you got elites in Washington who want to do what? Dominate the world. And that's precisely the thing that needs to be called into question. We can be a decent nation among nations. We can be a dignified nation among nations. We do not need to be an empire. Why? Because like the Roman Empire, like the British Empire, it's not only that they all dissolve, but they all have an arrogance and a hubris. And as Brother Martin Luther King used to say, I can hear the God of the universe saying, I'll break your power if you keep crushing these poor people and acting as if you're doing it in the name of liberty and equality, and you're really doing it in the name of your own greed, your own wealth, and your own power. That's a great tradition. And we need to keep that tradition alive any way we can. I'm just trying to do it because the movement spills over into electoral politics. I'm going to be doing it till the day I die, and I've been doing it prior to being a candidate. So as you look at the development of the BRICS, the the new international economic organization, that's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and then I think they've just admitted about another seven countries into the BRICS as both President Xi in China as well as President Putin of Russia have been talking about moving from the unipolar or the unilateral, where the United States is in control of everything, to a multilateral dynamic. How does a President Cornell West 
deal with the development of the BRICS? Well, one, you see, I, I, I look at the, uh, the multilateralism through the same lens. I look at the unilateralism, U.S. unilateralism on the one hand and the multicultural, multi-country multilateralism. Because you see, the multilateralism is still a combination of elites. And many of the countries that you talked about have high levels of repression and domination in their countries. I look at the world through the lens of the poor and the working classes in their respective countries, you see. And I want the United States to be in solidarity with the poor and working classes in India, for example. I'm not impressed by Modi. I know Modi is a Trump-like figure. Mm -hmm. I know Modi is not concerned about the poor. He's not concerned about the dollars. He's not concerned about the working class in India. So even when he at those BRICS meetings. I know he's not speaking on behalf of the masses of Indians. He's speaking on behalf of that very ugly Hindu nationalist movement that he's a part of. And so even when I look at the BRICS, I know that that is a sign that U.S. empire, and U.S. power is waning, but it's not as if simply because they're outside of the United States that they're not subject to the same criticism the mm -hmm. same standards as the United States itself is. They have their own elites. They have their own policies that do not speak to satisfying the needs of their own poor and their own working class or their own women or those who are outside of the, uh, the dominant religion. Look at the Muslims in India. I'm concerned about them. No, Modi's a Hindu nationalist, very narrow one mm -hmm. at that, because there's many Hindus who oppose him as well. And the same would be true in the other countries as well. Even South Africa, I mean, I, as you know, I mean, I have tremendous uh, you know, respect for the legacy of a Nelson Mandela or a, a, a Sister Susulu. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I had a chance to meet both of them when I was in South Africa. Uh, but the South African government today it doesn't speak to the needs of poor and working class South Africans. I'll say that to Brother Cyril. Mm -hmm. I have great respect for Brother Cyril, and I'm so glad he's taking Israel to the court, uh, the International Court of Justice, no doubt about that. And uh, I believe all, all the nations need to be called into question uh, if they commit war crimes. Hamas itself commits war crimes, but those war crimes are not crimes of genocide. They are war crimes. They're wrong. They're unjust, but there's not an attempt to act as if they're trying to wipe out a people. You mm -hmm. see? War crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of genocide, three different levels. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to always distinguish them so that when we talk about BRICS, I still don't want us to in any way assume that just because you get an Indian face or a Brazilian face or an African face that somehow they are concerned about the poor and working classes in their own respective nations. Most of them are not. Most of them are part of their own bourgeoisies. They're part of their own professional classes that look down and do not put the needs of poor and working people at the center of their government. And Nelson Mandela, for example, in some ways turning over in his grave when you look at the situation of poor people in Soweto uh, and what he was trying to do when he emerged out of that jail cell. Looking at, uh, is there an attack on independent thought and a growing sense of anti-intellectualism in the United States? Now, we look at the rise of the attacks on social media sites. We look at the attacks on independent journalists. The recent resignation of a former Harvard president, uh, Claudine Gay, Harvard's first African-American president uh, and a female. Uh, and 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 particularly looking at the manner in which uh, she was done away with, accusing her of plagiarism. So not only removing her from her position as president, but doing it in a manner of attacking her very character as a scholar, which seems like they almost want to see to it that she never gets another job in academia in her life. No, so no, is, is there is there an attack on intellectualism? And you truly, as an intellectual, speak to that, please. Mm, 
Mm, yeah. Well, one is that the United States has always been a deeply anti-intellectual country. Uh, the business of America is business. America has always been highly suspicious of those voices. That's why they put a bounty on the head of Ida B. Wells. They put a bounty on the head of Frederick Douglass. Mm. That's why they murdered Martin Luther King and Malcolm. That's why they kept Paul Robeson under house arrest at 4645 Walnut Street in Philadelphia. Why they put Du Bois under house arrest at 31 Grace Place in Brooklyn. It's why Eugene Debs had to run for president from the sale. When he ran on the Socialist Party, all he was doing was just giving speeches critical of the war. So America has always had a deep anti-intellectual impulse. It is certainly at work today and certainly is manifest today. And you're right. I'm glad you mentioned Sister, Sister, Sister Gay because uh, I think it's a very sad situation. It shows what happens when you get a little small group of highly uh, wealthy uh, uh, figures, billionaire figures, in this case, primarily Jewish figures who are uh, feel as if they can shape and reshape an institution by either withholding their monies or bringing power and pressure to bear to try to eliminate our dear sister Gay. You know, they had these major buses with her picture on it, right in mm -hmm. front of Harvard Yard, mm -hmm. national disgrace. They were, they, they, they were organized in front of her, her, her house and she got what, what she calls racial animus and these threats that she received. It's, it's a very ugly and a vicious thing. But, you know, there's an irony there, which is that, as you know, just a few, a few years ago, uh, I was actually pushed out of Harvard. Mm -hmm. That's I think why I'm asking you this question. Pro-Palestinian uh, stances. I was a faculty advisor to the uh, Palestinian student group. And uh, uh, they made it very clear that they, they were not going to... Uh, have been have tenured uh, faculties who had strong pro-Palestinian sensibilities, strong pro-Palestinian convictions. Now, at that time, Sister Gay was head of the faculty. She was dean of the faculty, which is third in charge after the provost. Larry Bacow, Alan Garber, Claudine Gay. And at that time, it was hard for her to come forward in support of me. No, and I didn't want to put her in a position. I know she was new. I know that she's betwixt and between. But the irony is that her silence at that time about those forces now comes back, or those same forces come back at her. And what's that? What's that adage? Uh, when they when they came for the Jews, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Jew. When they came for the Christians, I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Christian. Blah blah blah. By the time they got to me. When nobody left to defend when Nobody me. left. Mm -hmm. Now, see, many of us still supported her mm -hmm. because it's a matter of principle. Right. I mean, it, it's a deep, deep racism belief because what is happening right now, as you know, when you look at Ackerman, you look at Bloom, you look at Summers, the folk who are very much behind these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they're saying is, is that all of the black folk at Harvard, for the most part, do not belong because they didn't get there based on merit and excellence. They got there because of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're calling all of that into question. You just read the recent piece by Brett Stevens in New York Times. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the same brother who says anybody who calls it genocide must be anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. And yet the next moment, Nathan Yahoo can call Hamas's attack on precious Israelis genocidal, but that's not anti-Palestinian. Oh, no, no. See, the double standards, the hypocrisy is so overwhelming that it's hard to even sit still. And so now we are in a situation where it's not just the Harvards and University of Pennsylvanias and others, but you've got now these groups that say, we will dictate who your president is. We will dictate what the criteria is of who gets, gains access to professorships. We will even dictate some of the content of your curriculum because we got all this money. We got our names on the buildings. We will withhold it. Now it's not exclusively Jewish, but it is disproportionately Jewish mm -hmm. because it has to do with the issue of anti-Semitism. And you and I, we fight anti-Semitism. We're not gonna allow Jewish brothers and sisters to get degraded mm -hmm. and demeaned, but we're not gonna allow Palestinians to get degraded and demeaned, let alone black folk get degraded and demeaned. And it's very interesting, you see, when they come for us, 
you, you don't get a whole lot of defense and mm -hmm. concern about free expression, cancellation. The, the same groups that were against cancellation now are not just canceling a president, but forcing a president out. Where's the Congressional Black Caucus in defending her? Oh, the oh, Congressional Black Caucus is about as weak as pre-sweet and Kool-Aid. They ain't going to do nothing. So much of their money comes out of the big lobby, the APEC, and so forth. But also we could say NAACP, Sharpton's NAN, Urban League. So much of their money comes out of mm -hmm. Jewish elites. So that they, they, they got a noose around their neck. They can't say anything. They're not free. They're not free. <laughs> can, can you imagine John Coltrane showing up at the club and they got some? They got this scarf around his neck where he can't blow what he wants to blow. And they say, we want you to sound like you're playing Mozart. He said, yeah, I can play Mozart, but I feel like playing Love Supreme. I got to be free. We don't have enough free black folk. They locked in, they accommodated, they well adjusted to injustice. On the domestic front, as we move towards the uh, 2024 election, and we see that Biden's numbers have, he's hustling backwards. He, he's, he's around somewhere between 37 and 40 percent and on the wane. But one of the things that they're going to tout is Bidenomics. And what doesn't seem to get articulated in this discussion about Bidenomics is the financialized side of the economy is doing great. If you have a 401k, you are as happy as a clam. Uh, if you are invested in the stock market, you are mm -hmm. invested, you are you are just ecstatic at how well your portfolio has grown. But homelessness is up in America. Oh, homelessness yeah. has reached a level in this country, the likes we have not seen in years. That's right. So, how two things. One, how do the Democrats square that circle of Bidenomics doing so well, but I'll just say poverty as a overall blanket term is on the rise in America. When in fact the Democrats canceled the uh, the extra monies that were going into the Wix programs and the other uh, uh, child poverty programs during the, during the uh, COVID era, which I think came out of the Trump administration. Um, and then what does a president Cornell West do? Yes, again, you see, following the legacy of Brother Martin King, I'm an abolitionist when it comes to poverty. I want to abolish poverty. We could abolish poverty nearly overnight if we had a disinvestment from significant sums in the military and reinvestment mm -hmm. in jobs with a living wage, basic income support, housing, and free health care for all. We could do that. We have spent $5.6 trillion for wars in 20 years. We could abolish poverty with a small percentage of that. And wait a minute, and wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wars. wars that we have started. Yes. We started true. a conflict in Afghanistan. That's true. We started the Ukraine-Russian conflict. The Iraq, yes. We started that we went in and bombed Iraq. That's right. We went in and assassinated Gaddafi. That's true. And Gaddafi warned Barack Obama, don't mess with them folks in the West. You have no idea who you're dealing with. Do not mess with them. And the United States didn't. And we are right now trying our damnedest to start a fight with China. With China. Right. So I just would. So the Lockheed Martins of the world and the Raytheons of the world. That's right. Uh, we are. It's it's a money laundering scheme. We're taking our hard earned tax dollars, starting fights around the world. And then Lockheed Martin comes in saying, oh, I got the solution. Let's sell them some more F-35s and let's sell them some more uh, uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles at a million dollars a copy. That's right. Uh, I, I interrupted That's, you, sir. No, but you're absolutely right. And you think about this, though. You know, you got 62 percent of our fellow citizens are living paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. 50 percent of our fellow citizens have 2.6 percent of the wealth 
1% has 40% of the wealth. And of course, three individuals in the country have wealth equivalent to 50% of Americans. That's 160 million. That 160 million has wealth equivalent to three individuals. Now, all the Bidenomics in the world <laughs> does not address that kind of grotesque wealth inequality. This is the kind of thing Brother Bernie Sanders was rightly talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, Bernie hasn't been as strong as he ought on the Middle nope. East, hasn't been as strong as he ought on a number of different issues. But when it comes to Wall Street greed, when it comes to grotesque wealth inequality, he still hits the nail on the head. And if we're serious, I was just with uh, my dear brother, Pastor Q, and others down at Skid Row here in L.A., because, uh, you know, you got almost 40,000 precious brothers and sisters in Los Angeles have their own Skid Row, their own city. 40% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. are black. 90% of the town is black. Sounds like Oakland to me. Well, yeah, Oakland. And I was sounds just like, Oakland. I was just sounds like Sacramento to me. Kim and Sister Amy sound like Sac, though. I live in Harlem. Sound over like over there York. near over there near uh, uh, Cal Expo in Sacramento, along the American River, where all those encampments are. That's exactly right. I mean, it's a crime and a shame that mm -hmm. the richest nation in the history of the world, in the history of the species, still has that kind of poverty. And of course, it goes even beyond that because you got fossil fuel companies with their greed leading toward. Uh, ecological catastrophe and the uh, calling into question the very possibility of life on the planet if we don't come to terms with the shift from fossil fuel to renewable and regenerative forms of energy. So that, I mean, part of this is, is the philosophical question, which is to say, how is it that we human beings are just so downright wretched? Hmm. What we used to talk about in Shiloh, the hounds of hell, greed, Hatred, envy, resentment, fear, all used and manipulated to crush each other. That's so much the history of who we are as a species. But we're all so wonderful. We have the capacity to be better, to think, to feel, to love, to organize, to be in solidarity with those who are suffering, to have empathy and compassion and those two sides, the wretchedness and the wonderfulness. The yin and the yang. The yin and the yang, the ugliness and the beauty of a smile, a grin, the beauty of a friendship and a love, the beauty of a mama and a daddy, the beautiful, the beauty of people marching, fighting for something bigger than them, the beauty of being in solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza right now, given the indescribable realities that they have to deal with. But same is true with solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Sudan, with brothers and sisters in, in India, brothers, Jews in Russia, mm -hmm. whoever it is who's catching hell, we ought to be open to our solidarity. Why? Because that fights against the greed and the hatred and the fear and the wretchedness manifest in who we are as a species. As I was trying to figure out how to close this conversation, uh, well, you know what? Before I get to that, let me let me let me ask you this: As you are now not only talking to America but talking to the world, yeah. what are the what are the three salient, very important things? that you want those that are listening to this podcast, watching this podcast, what are they, other than you being brilliant and being from Sacramento and Southland Park Drive like me, what, it, <laughs> what is it that you want uh, the audience to really understand about Dr. Cornell West? I want them to understand that I come from a great people, a black people, people who after being terrorized, traumatized, and hated for 400 years have continually dished out love warriors, freedom fighters, joy sharers, and wounded healers. And I'm just a small little wave in that grand ocean. And what sits at the center of that great tradition of black folk, just like this John Coltrane, I got it, could have been, a, could be Aretha, could be Luther Vandross, could be a whole host of others, could be a. Philip Randolph, early by a Russian, rustic, is courage to think critically in quest for truth, the courage to act 
compassionately in pursuing justice. And then also the courage to love and laugh, to laugh at yourself, to know that you a cracked vessel, to know that you try again, fell again and fell better, that nobody's a messiah, nobody's a savior. We're here to make the world just a little better than we found it. As Reverend Cook used to tell us, if the kingdom of God is within us, then everywhere we go, we ought to leave a little heaven behind. Amen, my brother, amen. Let me, uh, so I was trying to figure out how to end this conversation. And it dawned on me as I was going from idea to idea. I said, I've got a piece. This is from a book, Knowledge, Power, and Black Politics by Dr. Mac H. Jones, Ooh. who I think you know. Oh, he's a giant. He's a giant. And uh, I, I, I went to this. It's a collection of essays that he's written over the years. And chapter 17, Cornell West, the insurgent black intellectual, race matters, a critical, a critical comment. And this is part of what Mac writes. Cornell West has established himself as one of the leading political thinkers of our time. And it is fitting and appropriate that we pause and reflect on his ideas. When we engage in such an exchange of ideas, we continue a long enduring tradition within the black community that goes back to the beginning of our sojourn on these shores. In spite of what our detractors are wont to say, principal dialogue and debate have always been a part of black cultural life in the United States and it is alive and well, even as we speak. I've been familiar with West scholarship for quite some time. I've read and studied most of his published works and found them for the most part to be challenging, insightful, and often provocative. I've used some of his essays in my classes with good results. They address issues and problems essential to our survival and evolution as a people, and he makes us think more deeply about them. Professor West is a decided asset to us as a people and to the human family in general. And so to that, I ask the audience, or I wanna leave the audience with this. I'm not gonna be presumptuous enough to try to tell people how they should vote or who they should vote for. I merely ask them to consider this. Do you want a former President Trump, a man who Senator Lindsey Graham called a race baiting xenophobic bigot and a jackass? Now that's not me, that's Lindsey Graham. Or do you want a President Biden who is in a state of cognitive decline, started a war in Ukraine, trying to start a war with China, is a self-proclaimed Zionist who is backing, funding, and supporting genocide? Or do you want to consider a man who the brilliant Dr. Mac H. Jones says makes us think more deeply about these issues? He is a decided asset to us as a people and to the human family in general. My brother, Dr. Cornell West, with that, uh, what you got, man? <laughs> wow. oh, brother. Oh, well, you moved me very deeply, though. Mac Jones was one of the great giants that he invited me to come to Prairie View, and he was teaching there, and he and I talked together, wrestled together. I learned so much from him. I really just sat at his feet. He was just so, so kind. You know, great Adolph Reed mm -hmm. worked with him as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, with Mac Jones there at Atlanta University, but uh, uh, for you to read his words at the beginning of 2024, you don't know what that means to me, though, man, because uh, I had such deep love and respect for uh, for Mac Jones, and he, he has such a, uh, he, he's like Brother Ron at Howard, uh, uh, Walters, and he has- He's the reason I have a PhD in political science, it's because of him. Is that right? Yeah, I studied under him. I went to Howard and studied under him at Howard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Like, Because both of those brothers, they were 
at the peak of academic achievement, but they had such a deep love for the people. A love for black people, a love for oppressed people, a love for people catching hair, hell everywhere in the world. And to see that in the flesh, as a young brother for me, this is 35 years ago when I'm talking mm -hmm. about Mac Jones, you see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just meant the world to me. And I've seen it before in other examples, but to be able to see it in him mm -hmm. meant so much to me. And for you to read those words just fires me up, brother. It fortifies me. I think I'm going to run on and see what the end going to be. I'm <laughs> well, Dr. Cornell West, 2024 candidate for president of the United States. I want to thank you for joining me today. I want to thank you for connecting the dots. Thank you, my brother. Love you. Respect you, man. Uh, man, and you know I love you. Folks, thank you so much for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon, and stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, please follow and subscribe. Leave a review. Please share the show. Follow us on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. Because remember that this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter, and we don't chatter on Connecting the Dots. See you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a good one. Peace and blessings. I'm out. Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.